Hey everybody, I have a video here for you today, and first of all, I just want to mention a few things. I want to say welcome to my new subscribers, and uh, thanks to Matt over at Ancient Architects for giving me a shout out in his latest video. I got a bunch of new subscribers overnight, and that's really cool when we all share each other's channels, and there doesn't seem to be any uh, competition. We all get along and just like sharing other people's good research uh, as well as our own. I think that's really cool. And next time I talk to you, I will be going. I will be over fifty thousand subscribers. So that is, I don't even know what to say about that. I enjoyed it when I had a thousand subs, and my videos just got watched a few hundred times. But we are going to go down to. Well, and I also want to mention this to my new subs. I also make some videos with my friends who are performers in Las Vegas. And uh, those of you who enjoy those videos, and especially Dendal's, you can do me and especially her a favor. Starting in May, you can request her song, Where I Come From, from your local radio station, country radio station. I just wanted to mention that. But we are going to go down here to Natchez, the site of Grand Village. Am I saying that right? Those are my, uh, my new subs. I mispronounce at least three words per video. But this is a look at the site neighborhood nearby, but there seems to be some preservation here. And I wasn't too familiar with this site before I had a request to talk about this. And then I found the story of a gentleman I'm going to talk about and a story that needs to be told. But here is a look. I guess there was three main mounds here. And at one time, the great chief, the chief of the sun, lived right on top of what they call Mount B here. And if you want to leave any diagrams or any further information on this site, go ahead, because the main gist of this video is going to be on the research of a gentleman whose story needs to be told. And here it is from overhead, and you notice kind of a horseshoe bend in the river that this site sits on top of. But uh, there was some research done here by an archaeologist in the mid-1800s. And his story and his work has just kind of been forgotten or pushed aside or both. Seems like he was a very early archaeologist and did some very good research. And it was pretty extensive. And his work has just been kind of pushed aside, lost to time, forgotten. Is there like a cover-up of prehistory in the United States? Nah, I don't think it's a cover-up. I just think it's just a lack of of recognition of early work that suggests a di kind of a different earlier history, maybe. But here is a painting done based on the field notes of Mr. Dickinson. It says, the history of archaeology is populated by a varied cast of scholars, showmen, adventurers, and charlatans. This article examines the career of a little-known pioneer of American archaeology, Montrovel Wilson Dickinson, who lived from 1810 to 1882, Dickinson, a Philadelphia physician, conducted extensive excavation on archaeological sites in Louisiana and Mississippi in the 1840s, amassing a collection of thousands of artifacts. He also acquired, through purchase or trade, material from 17 other states or territories. More importantly, he contributed to two great questions debated in 19th century archaeology. When did the first people arrive in the New World? and who had constructed the enormous prehistoric earthworks found along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. It says Dickinson was not alone in his interest in North American archaeology. Thomas Jefferson is generally credited with being the first American archaeologist. In 1784, the sage of Monticello conducted excavations at a small prehistoric burial mound or barrow near Charlottesville. Jefferson was interested in determining the age of the mound. In his words, that they were repositories of the dead has been obvious to all, but on what particular occasion constructed was a matter of doubt. And that's according to Jefferson in 1787. Other researchers shared Jefferson's interest. The 19th century saw a growing fascination with America's prehistoric past. As settlers crossed Appalachians and headed for the fertile bottomlands of the Midwest, they encountered spectacular earthworks of varied forms. Few of these pioneers were willing to attribute these structures to Native Americans past or present. The tribes 
they were familiar with, particularly in the Northeast, were not known to build earthen mounds. Moreover, many Native American peoples were in social disarray, reeling from years of warfare, and their populations were much reduced by disease and poverty. To some observers, they seemed hardly capable of constructing the massive mounds. And then that's kind of where this whole question gets interesting. It's like, who built these? Did some Native Americans come across some ruins that were very ancient? I mean, we have dates on some of these places that are 5,000 years old. So who is building these? But some that I have shown were clearly built, maybe in that uh, 800,000 year ago period. I have no problem with that. But were they just reconstructing monuments from the old legends that built these original really big structures like we have at Poverty Point? Well, that's a good question. Going on here, it says, his brother William, the author of his posthumous biographical sketch, wrote that medicine was not the only object of his life. The passion for research in the new field of American archaeology took him to the valleys of Ohio and the Mississippi, where for seven years, or from 1837 to 1844, he was a constant traveler. Montrovo's own notes indicate that he might be better have been described as a constant excavator. Moreover, he was apparently in Mississippi as late as 1847, for in that year he was excavating on one of John A. Quitman's plantations in Springfield. There he found a large Indian mound which contained immense quantities of skulls and bones of natives who he estimated had inhabited the area a thousand years earlier. News of the archaeological find soon appeared in several newspapers, one as far away as Houston, Texas. Now here is the map that is in the article, and I find this very interesting. He documents a whole bunch of mound sites. Seems there is a half arc here. And right down here, I notice a circular structure that kind of reminds me of Poverty Point right there. We have some sort of circular mound hinge. Is this a hinge up here? But he has a lot of interesting things. But you can find this map in the article I'm reading. It says, despite the fact that he was active over 150 years ago, a variety of sources survive which can cast light on Dickinson's research. One is a previously mentioned sketch written by his brother, who was also a physician and a naturalist. Montroville himself penned a series of short articles for the Philadelphia literary magazine, The Lotus. In these, he presented his conclusion to a public audience, something few archaeologists find the time to do. However, the most important surviving sources are Dickinson's original notebook and an accompanying artifact catalog curated in the University of Pennsylvania Museum archives, a large and fairly detailed map of Natchez, Mississippi, showing many of the mound groups, which he was familiar, is also held by the museum. According to Dickinson's notes, he spent seven years in investigation of the southern mound builder's relics in which upward of 1,000 tumuli of that long lost and unhistorical people were opened. Although he was an archaeological pioneer and might even be described as an archaeological visionary, his reported numbers are often contradictory and may well be exaggerated. For instance, the number of mounds investigated is open to debate. As noted above, one source claims more than 1,000. His best-known publication, the American Numismatic Manual, claims 1,043 mounds. In his artifact catalog lists closer to 40 mound groups. Which these discrepancies are rather spectacular, there is no question that the hyperbole-prone doctor was actively ex excavating prehistoric earthworks, and he did work here, good work, and here is like a cross-section of a mound, and they're not sure which mound this is, but these were pyramidal-shaped, and they had layers of different material, soil, gravel, rocks, and I have talked about that in previous mound builder videos from a few years ago. Dickinson carried out extensive excavations in an effort to solve the questions he posed. His techniques were fairly sophisticated for the time. Like Jefferson before him, he advocated using trenches to section mounds, a technique that would remain popular well into the 20th century. More importantly, he took detailed notes on the stratigraphy at a time when many archaeologists saw soil as an impediment to be removed 
Dickinson was aware of the importance of soil layers for interpreting the development of the sites. One of the most interesting documents found among his papers is a cross-section of an unidentified mound in Louisiana or Mississippi with the various layers of soil carefully delineated and described along with his accompanying artifacts. A painting done from Dickinson Field Notes showing a mound with distinct soil strata is a common illustration in archaeological text. Although his notes are not detailed enough to let us know whether he excavated stratigraphically or simply recognize the importance of strata, his excavation nonetheless predates some 50 years those of recognized pregenerators of American strat stratigraphic excavations. And it gives a list of a few of those people here. In terms of artifacts, Dickinson had wide-ranging interests. He collected pottery, stone tools, historic artifacts, human skeletons, and fossils. Unlike many of his contemporaries, he noticed the waste flake or debitage generated during the manufacture of stone tools. Seems like this guy knew what he was doing. Today, his work is mostly unknown. But people have wondered what are inside of these mounds. Are they just mounds of dirt? No. But here is a drawing based on this guy's field notes. Here, I think this might be home of the chief, the chief of the sun up here. But here you can see the different layers. And does this represent where the body was found? That looks like a skeleton right there. But these different layers of earthen material, some soil, some clay, gravel, sand, whatever. There is meaning to this and there is purpose. These people knew what they were doing. Seems the artifacts were found right under the top and the body. It looks like there's a little chamber for the body right there. I find that picture fascinating. This might be the best documentation of the mounds coming from maybe 150, 160 years ago. Now one thing Mr. Dickinson was criticized about, and if you read that article, it goes into that a little bit, but he describe some of the mound builder relics to relics from other places such as Egypt and Mesoamerica, I believe, and other really ancient ruins and pyramid sites. And that's why he was kind of criticized. But what I noticed here, now I have mentioned this in my pyramid videos, where is the burial chamber? It's right underneath the apex of the pyramid, the so-called burial tomb chamber. And if that is a pro appropriate description of those places, well, whatever they are. But I notice this is right under, if this was a pyramid, this burial tomb would have been right underneath the apex of the pyramid or the mount. Just thought I'd bring that up. Should he have been criticized for bringing up those similarities to other ancient cultures? Well, I don't think so. And here is a look at one of the artifacts Mr. Dickinson found. Tobacco pipe? I thought that looked pretty cool. It says, today with better excavation and particularly more accurate dating techniques, archaeologists recognize that the mounds reflect not one, but several distinct prehistoric cultural traditions stretching from roughly 2000 BC to 1500 AD. And the more we know, that 2000 BC date gets pushed back, just like in other areas of the world. It says they include the Adena and Hopewell mortuary complexes as well as the widespread Mississippian culture. Some of the mounds served as burial sepulchres, while many supported temples, still others may have had astronomical functions. Mastodons. One of Dickinson's excavations clearly dealt with an occupation predating the mound builders. Excavating near Natchez, Dickinson uncovered a fossilized human pelvis in a stratum of clay underlying the bones of several extinct animals. The find, which was subsequently known as the Natchez pelvis, seemed to indicate the great antiquity of human occupation in the New World. Scientists from as far afield as Great Britain visited the site where it was found. Sir Charles Lyell, the father of modern geology, was not convinced by what he saw. However, later scholars who re-examined the bones concluded that the pelvis and the assorted and the associated fossils were substantially of the same antiquity. But this Sir Charles Lyell, 
What was his name? Shermer? No. Sir Charles Lyell, the father of modern geology, was not convinced. But later, later people agreed that they were the same age. Human fossilized bones were the same age as some of the megafauna that went extinct roughly 11,600 years ago or so. Now here's one of the posters from Mr. Dickinson's lectures on American archaeologies. And now this is where this story started to bug me. And when I read what I'm going to read now, this is when I knew I would be presenting this story to you. My channel is a lot about lost history and the story of some people that need to be told, like Mr. Gonaim, who found the golden alabaster sarcophagus down in Saqqara. Some of these stories need to be told, and when I read this next part, I knew I would be presenting this to you today. In 1882, following a short illness, Montrovel Dickinson died. No obituary notices from Philadelphia newspapers have been found. Two of his sisters inherited the collection, which was sold in 1899 by his brother William to Stuart Cooman director of the University of Pennsylvania Museum. It was an important acquisition, and Coulomb published a description of it in 1900. Since then, it has seen only sporadic study, and Dickinson himself has lapsed into archae archaeological obscurity. In 1953, the Mississippi Panorama was transferred to the St. Louis Museum of Art, but the rest of the collection remains at the University of Pennsylvania. And that panorama, the Mississippi panorama, somebody did a 100-foot-long, over 100-foot-long painting panorama in sections based on his work. It says, despite amassing an incredible collection of thousands of artifacts, providing above-average documentation on his excavations and lecturing widely, Dickinson has been forgotten. Why? His contemporaries, Ephraim Squire, and Edwin Davis has summed up their research in Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley, written in 1848, a well-illustrated monograph that remains widely read today. Dickinson, however, only published his findings locally in serialized form. His one well-known publication, the American Numismatic Manual, is full of conjectures and summarizes particularly regarding Native American use of stone, clay, and metal tokens as money. It stands in stark contrast with his thoughtful private notebook. He was fond of exaggeration. In fact, at times he seems more showman than scientist. Several of the items in his collection may be frauds, including a Galena crystal inscribed with an Ankh, the ancient Egyptian sign for life. One must recognize, however, that in the museum field, Dickinson was competing with the likes of P.T. Barnum, then theatrical proprietor of American Museum in New York history, or in New York City, excuse me. Dickinson exaggerations seem tame in comparisons with Barnum's famous hokum. But it seems he did good work and maybe added a little pizzazz to his work, but shouldn't we just filter out the meaningful stuff from the kind of showy stuff, well, I think we should, and that's typical of a lot of people reporting in this time period. It says, Montrovel Dickinson was an innovative and skillful early archaeologist who recognized, described stratigraphy, noted the stages of stone tool manufacture, and used anthographic analogies to interpret his sites. His work contributed to the debates on when people initially arrived in the New World, their possible contemporaneity with extinct animals as mastodons and the origins and final fate of the mound builders. Many of his hypotheses were right. The first Native American pioneers did arrive in the New World at a time when it was populated by several species of large animals, the megafauna, many which would subsequently become extinct. And yes, later Native Americans were responsible for building the earthworks which dotted the central and southeastern portion of the country. And that comes from a period 800 to 1,000 years ago, but then it also says there were different periods of building history, and that goes back to maybe four, 5,000 years ago, and that has been dated at Poverty Point and Watson Break. And we have a site in Florida that's at least 7,000 years old where they were burying their dead in a ceremonial fashion. 
And I know Matt over at Ancient Architects did a video on that maybe about a month or, month or so ago, and I covered that about three years ago, and I think that's a fascinating story and new findings. He brought those forward. But here are some of the artifacts that he has found, and I guess some of these, there was some question, like if they were familiar to Egyptian glyphs, did he just forge these, or are they just kind to uh, discredit his work because he's stating an earlier history or connection to somebody that there shouldn't have been any connection to. I, these are just things I wonder and bringing up. But clearly some symbols here for water, maybe Orion, and some other things that are familiar. His brother said this, it says, Informing his collection, he was animated not by an eye for the curious. He looked upon antique objects with the eyes of a scholar and the knowledge of a scientist, and in their aggregation deduced many lessons of value to himself and those who came after him as illustrating the manners and customs of ancient peoples. It says, his collections and papers, as well as other collections acquired by the University of Pennsylvania Museum in its early days, still have much to offer researchers. In the case of Dickinson, they also illustrate the story of one of the most interesting characters in archaeology's family tree. But I just thought I would bring you the story of Metrovil Dickinson. Seems he did some very interesting work. Should he be ignored? Because he brings up a possibly earlier story than what we have been taught. Brings up a lot of interesting points. Seems he was controversial. But anybody bringing up an earlier story to what we have been taught is going to be controversial. Was he discredited, forgotten, just because he's controversial and brings up a possible earlier past in the Americas. Well, people like this who did good work, clearly he did some good work. It shouldn't be ignored. It should be part of the whole process we take in when we're trying to form our own thoughts on this time and come up with our own, our own stories based on what we know. His story should be included, and that's why I'm talking about it today. Hope you thought that was cool, and you all have a very nice day. Your Natchez History Minute is brought to you by Natchez National Historical Park. Although largely forgotten today, Montreauville Wilson Dickinson was a pioneer of American archaeology. Born in Pennsylvania in 1810, Dickinson was trained as a physician and attended medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. In 1837, however, he began an archaeological journey along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. From 1842 to 1847, he conducted extensive explorations of Native American mounds in the Natchez Bluffs area. He excavated several large mound groups in the Mislu region, including many that no longer exist. Dickinson included his notes from a number of his excavations from the Natchez area in articles for the Philadelphia literary magazine, The Lotus. He also penned an article with lumberman Andrew Brown on cypress trees and wrote a numismatic manual on money in American Aboriginal cultures. Dickinson is probably best remembered for painting a moving panorama that is nine feet tall and 400 feet long. It depicts the Native American culture, the resettlement of their land by white Americans, their slaves and black freedmen. Many of the scenes are from the Natchez Bluffs area of mounds that exist today. After his death in 1881, Dickinson's extensive collection of thousands of artifacts was purchased by the University of Pennsylvania. Hello, I'm Jim Barnett, retired from the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, and this has been your Natchez History Minute.